Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, the host of this conference series entitled Restoring Our Civil Liberties. Welcome back. If you're brand new to FFF because of this, these two presentations, our mission at FFF for 31 years has been to present the principled uncompromising case for the libertarian philosophy. Uh, we have a real treat for you to, tonight, probably, and I underline the word probably, we have a twofer for you. Uh, two speakers for the price of one, two great speakers. We got um, George Leaf, the first speaker, and then probably Radley Balco, but Radley just notified us that he's having internet problems and he's contacted Google. Uh, there's a chance that he'll get it all fixed up by the end of George's talk. If not, we'll just reschedule him to um, another week along with one of the other speakers. Uh, so uh, again, as, as Bart indicated before we got started, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. That's where questions can be asked to George. You just type them in there. They come to me and then I'll read them for, to George. Uh, so we're, we're really pleased to have George Leaf as our first speaker tonight. Uh, longtime supporters of FFF know that George is a longtime contributor to our monthly journal, Future of Freedom. He's written some of the best book reviews that I think we've ever published. In fact, I think George is probably the greatest book review writer in, in the whole libertarian movement. <laughs> his, his, his reviews are absolutely great, along with his ah, articles. Thanks so much. <laughs> He's the director of editorial content for the James G. Martin Academic, uh, Mar uh, Center for Academic Renewal. Uh, George holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree from Carroll College in Waukesha, Wisconsin and uh, Dr. Jurisprudence from Duke University School of Law. He served as vice president of the John Locke Foundation until 2003. And prior to the Locke Foundation, he was president of Patrick Henry Associates, a consulting firm in Michigan dedicated to assisting others understanding and advocating free markets, minimal government, private property, and individual rights. He has served on the faculty of Northwood University in Midland, Michigan, where he taught courses in economics, business law, and logic. He's also worked as a policy advisor in the Michigan Senate. He, as I indicated, he's one of the best writers in the libertarian movement. He's a regular columnist for Forbes.com. He was a book review editor of The Freeman, which was, of course was published by the Foundation for Economic Education. From, uh, he was the book review editor from 96 to 2012. He's published numerous articles in libertarian publications like the Freeman, Reason, the Free Market, Cato Journal, uh, along with other publications like the Detroit News. And uh, he writes regularly for National Reviews, The Corner Blog, and for seethroughedu.com. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to have you join us, George. Thank you for being with us. Uh, my pleasure, and thanks so much for the invitation to speak on a topic that is near to my heart and has been so for a long, long time. Now, I've entitled my remarks tonight, Liberty in America, Are We Past the Point of No Return? Now, since this is the time of COVID, perhaps it's the era or even the eon of COVID, I'm going to begin with a medical analogy. Every one of us has gotten sick many times from various maladies, and each time recovered fully. Healthy organisms are able to do that, to fend off attacks from pathogens and resume normal living. Unfortunately, we've also all known people who could not fend off the illnesses that beset them. Cancer, heart disease, diabetes, COVID, and other ailments can so weaken an individual that he or she reaches a point beyond which recovery is impossible. The disease has progressed so far and has so undermined the person's ability to resist that the situation becomes hopeless. The disease overcomes him and he dies. Now, the reason I start with that bit of grim reality is that I think it applies to the condition of liberty in America. I fear that we are the forces opposed to a free liberal society have become so strong that they overwhelm liberty's defenses and achieve their goal of imposing on us 
to borrow the title of a book by Ludwig von Mises, Omnipotent Government. If that comes to pass, we'll live in a country where what little freedom is left to us will actually be privileges dispensed by the state. The ruling politicians will tell people that they have freedom, expecting to focus on what the government gives them, not on what it has taken away. Well, let's start with some history. We're used to calling the United States the land of liberty, and early on, it certainly was. People were free to go about their lives without interference from other citizens, since the laws were against all sorts of theft, fraud, coercion, and violence. And the government had no power to force people to do this or forbid them to do that. Early Americans were truly free people, and that freedom unleashed energy and innovation such as the world had never seen. When Alexis de Tocqueville visited the U.S. in 1830, he marveled at the incessant industry of the people which contrasted with Europeans who were far more constrained by laws and regulations and were much less productive than Americans. Liberty not only made Americans productive, it also made them responsible because their mistakes or failures fell upon themselves. Those who suffered hard times usually received assistance from others in the community, but that was given out of generosity. It was not an entitlement. Millions of people from all across the globe flocked to America because they wanted the liberty available here. But at this time, there were some Americans who were not happy with the nation's freedom. They didn't like the fact that freedom made it possible for some people to get rich and they and envy gnawed at those people. They wanted power to knock down the successful and redistribute their wealth. And there were also people who disliked the responsibility that comes with liberty. Instead of that, they wanted others to make decisions for them and ensure that their needs would be taken care of. And there were also some people who were just natural busybodies who thought they knew better than others and wanted to be able to dictate what they should or shouldn't do. Most of them were moralists who couldn't abide other people doing things that they disapproved of, drinking, gambling, not adhering to religious scriptures and so forth. Fortunately, those Americans were frustrated because the law gave them no leverage, no leverage for their status, collectivist, busybody inclinations. Legally, they could do nothing to redistribute the wealth of others, create welfare entitlements, or dictate behavior to other people. They could and did complain, and they could also try to persuade people to give up some of their wealth and change their ways. Sometimes they were successful at that but coercion was out. In our early history, most Americans were liberals in the original meaning of the word. They believed in a golden rule, live and let live philosophy. But that began to change beginning in the 19th century when some politicians figured out they could win elections by promising to enact laws that would take liberty and property away from some people. Those politicians, populists, progressives, and socialists, <clears throat> won over many voters with their visions of a more fair society, which they claimed would be achieved by expanding the scope and power of government. Politicians of that stripe gave us laws restricting the freedom of contract, particularly in the pricing of goods and services where the public interest supposedly called for government control. They gave us business regulations, starting with the railroads, which meant that managerial freedom was increasingly replaced by bureaucratic decrees. They gave us antitrust laws, allowing government officials to decide when a business was too big. <clears throat> and they gave us the Federal Reserve System, which was expected to control the economy by managing the nation's money and credit. <clears throat> they gave us the income tax, which Frank Kodorov accurately described as the root of all evil, by facilitating the growth of the federal Leviathan. And they gave us prohibition, a foolish moralistic crusade that caused untold death and destruction, a tax on liberty all. They also gave us war, conscription, government economic management, and the evisceration of the First Amendment as people were punished for speaking out against the government's war policies. By the early 20th century, liberty in America had been substantially decreased. While we still thought of ourselves as free and compared with other countries, we were, liberty was giving way to government power. 
the authoritarians had made great strides toward transforming America into the unfree, governmentally regimented nation that they desired. The progressive populist offensive against our liberty ran out of steam in the 1920s, but unlike an illness from which an individual can fully recover, many of their victories for government power remained in place. In fact, most of them still hobble us. Once a law or policy that restricts liberty is in place, it's extremely difficult ever to eliminate it. Now, as you all know very well, our freedoms continue to contract during, during FDR's New Deal, LBJ's Great Society, the big government conservatism of the Bushes, the blatantly authoritarian Obama years, Trump, and now Biden promises breathtaking expansions of state power. The enemies of liberty have grown increasingly brazen in their assaults on what is left of freedom in America. Statists in and out of government realize they can get away with almost anything and have no shame in trying. I believe that they envision something like a final solution to the people who don't like the idea of living under their powerful government. Now to underscore my fear, let's focus on some recent events. Liberty is besieged on many fronts and perhaps the most shocking is freedom of speech. That pillar of our society is crumbling. Voltaire famously declared, I may disagree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. That was the philosophy behind the First Amendment's prohibition against laws infringing upon freedom of speech or the press. Most Americans used to believe that no matter how much we disagreed with someone else's opinions, they were entitled to have their say. Few among us used to think that people should be silenced or punished for speaking their minds. Few, but not none. We've always had some people who thought it proper to win arguments and get their way by silencing or punishing their opponents. Woodrow Wilson thought so during World War I. FDR used government power to harass his critics. During the Cold War, conservatives favored using government to punish anyone who said anything good about communism or against American foreign policy. Those seeds of speech authoritarianism have grown into a strangling jungle. Many Americans led by woke social justice warrior types see no good in freedom of speech. Instead, they want controlled speech with themselves in control over what thoughts may be expressed and what ones not. Now, before going into some examples, I'd like to note that the case against freedom of speech has its roots in academia. <clears throat> going back more than a decade, there have been professors writing articles arguing that the First Amendment is outmoded they want authorities to aggressively monitor speech and call out anything that they regard as hate speech or misinformation, which boils down to any communication that might lead people to doubt the leftist agenda. Those academics abandoned the idea that the best speech policy is no policy at all, and that we should leave the marketplace of ideas alone. The leftist idea that government should control markets for goods has now spread into the world of ideas. Why permit liberty anywhere? This academic hostility to free speech was highlighted back in September as students returned to Princeton University. They were met with a message from the school's Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. I'll quote from a newspaper story about it, which is written by two Princeton faculty members, John Londrigan and Sergio Kleinerman. I quote, an official video freshmen are required to watch presents an utterly one-sided and negative picture of Princeton's history. The video and the accompanying website are expensively produced and includes a discourse in which classics professor Dan L. Padilla Peralto characterizes free speech as privilege rather than a right and in which he disparages the speech of others with whom he disagrees as masculinized bravado. Padilla Peralto goes on to extol free speech and intellectual discourse that is flexed to one specific aim, and that aim is the promotion of social justice and anti-racial social justice at that. Now this position, I'm sorry to say, is now widespread throughout our education system and beyond. Speech should not be free, but instead directed to achieve certain ends in their view. Now, in my work at the James G. Martin Center, I come across cases of speech authoritarianism all the time. 
Let me give you a small sampling. In 2019, at the University of North Texas, a young math professor named Nathaniel Hires was in the faculty lounge when he noticed a stack of flyers on a table advertising a talk about microaggressions, one of those woke fads that has swept through our education system. Now, Hires did not touch the flyers, but he drew an arrow on the adjacent whiteboard pointing to the flyers and wrote, someone should take out the trash. A sarcasm came to the attention of the chairman of the math department who conducted an investigation to find out who the culprit was. Among woke academics, which now includes mathematicians, there is no tolerance for criticism of their sacred ideas. Under questioning, Hires admitted that the comment was his handiwork. The chairman first decided to suspend him and then decided to terminate his contract saying that Hires did not exemplify the values of the department. Now, Hires has filed suit against the university and the case is ongoing. Unfortunately, there's almost no chance that the university officials who demanded his firing over a matter having nothing to do with his job performance will suffer any personal costs. But Hires might get his job back and recover damages at the expense of the university, which is to say the taxpayers. However this case turns out though, the key point is that a high highly placed academician thinks that his de department cannot tolerate the presence of someone who dissents from left-wing orthodoxy. Liberty is not the chairman's value, conformity is. On our college campuses, everyone has to be careful not to upset or offend anyone for fear of reprisal. Many schools have vague speech codes and or harassment policies, along with biased response teams eager to deal with any perceived slight. And if a speaker is invited to campus who anyone dislikes, disruptive protests are likely, and if the talk is allowed, if the talk is allowed at all. Now, many students will claim that the very presence of such a speaker makes them feel unsafe. Instead of mounting car counter arguments against ideas they don't agree with, many Americans now automatically turn to the use of coercion against those people who disagree with them. And rather than telling students that they should behave like adults when faced with contending points of view, our education leaders usually cheer them on. Instances like the hires case are legion. Students and faculty members who are identified as unwoke are targets for the vengeful social justice warrior types. Another case. When University of Pennsylvania law professor Amy Wax, a tenured veteran of many years and recipient of the teaching awards, wrote an op-ed piece in which she defended bourgeois values, she was immediately attacked by a mob of Penn students and fellow faculty members for writing a piece that they declared hurtful. The students wanted her to be fired while the faculty, understanding tenure, merely demanded that she be censured for her terrible views. Never was there any effort at making an argument that she was wrong, but the mere fact that she said the traditional values were the key to success was enough to make her persona non grata. And the law school dean didn't defend her against the mob. Instead, to placate it, he chose to take away from her the first year civil procedure course that she had taught so well for many years. That sent a terrible message to future lawyers that it's okay to throw a tantrum when you hear ideas that you don't like. Now such intolerance now infects the legal profession. For example, a lawyer named Maud Maron who worked in the New York uh, City Legal Aid Program, a woman with an excellent record of representing people who couldn't afford to hire an attorney was recently kicked out of the legal aid program. Why? because she had said something against the onslaught of critical race theory teaching in public schools. Now that opinion was one that branded her as an enemy of progressivism. She had to go, never mind that losing her abilities as a lawyer would be detrimental to legal aid clients. Now back to teaching. Lately, lots of teachers have been fired or punished for daring to say on their own time, that the false and divisive critical race theory ideas should not be taught in our schools, and also for opposing the draconian COVID measure that had been decreed for schools. But once again, liberty is not valued by those in power. Conformity. 
speech that doesn't suit the leftist agenda is spread out from the education system into the whole of our society. Google, for example, fired engineer James Damore after he posted a reasoned, carefully documented essay online where he argued that the company's diversity policy favoring women was neither necessary nor beneficial for the company. Once word got around that he had criticized diversity, he was accused by Google of creating a hostile work environment that women found threatening. Now, this was merely because of arguments he had posted. Damon, Damore had to be fired. The freedom to speak is obviously not important at Google. What's important is fidelity to leftist groupthink. Now, here's a case I find particularly disgusting. The longtime principal first flutist at the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra was recently terminated because of social media posts where she expressed her doubts about the safety of COVID vaccines and also whether Joe Biden's presidential election was legitimate. Obviously, those ideas have nothing to do with her playing in the orchestra, but the management decided that she had to go because her politically incorrect beliefs were embarrassing to them. Furthermore, doctors have been threatened with a loss of their licenses by state boards of medicine for, writing that, for writings that question the board's official line that everyone must get the COVID vaccine. Now, whether the skeptical doctors had sound reasons or for that or not didn't matter. The medical establishment has its party line and wants no dissent from it. It's also worth mentioning that the social media companies have decided that they should monitor speech and block communications that they don't like. It's evident that those companies have allied themselves with the interests of the statists. They have been blocking communications, for example, discussing the nefarious doings of Hunter Biden or questioning government statements about the efficacy of COVID vaccines. Now, I'm not saying that that should be illegal. Firms are entitled to have their own policies. My point is that their posting rules favoring big government show opposition to freedom of speech now pervades big business in America. It's hard to believe that the managers of the big tech firms don't expect something in return from the state when they censor information that could cause people to question whether government officials are truly acting for their benefit. The alliance of business with government is a frightening prospect for the future of liberty. Now, cases like the ones I have mentioned would have been unthinkable in the past. But the political landscape in America is changing rapidly. The authoritarians used to be content with taking a razor to our freedoms, but now they're using a meat cleaver. And many Americans seem to be content and even eager to go along because they don't much believe in freedom either. Of course, it isn't just freedom of speech that's under attack. Many other freedoms are also being chopped away. And COVID is providing, providing the excuse for that. On September 9th, President Biden announced that he intends to compel companies employing more than 100 workers to force their workers to take COVID vaccines. And that's on top of other rec another recent decree that all federal workers must submit to the needle. Now, we used to expect, respect individual liberty enough not to demand invasions of bodily integrity. The idea of forced medical procedures has stood in bad odor in this country ever since the infamous case where that progressive Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes approved a compulsory sterilization of a mentally challenged woman, writing three generations of imbeciles are enough. For many decades, the idea, my body, my choice, has been generally accepted among Americans, but now our dear leader thinks it's proper to compel people to choose between a vaccine they may distrust or think unnecessary and the loss of employment. That's just one of the many liberty losses we've suffered during the pandemic. The authoritarians have fully embraced the never let a crisis go to waste concept and have used COVID as, as, as the excuse for wiping out a lot of our liberty. The Biden regime used the Center for Disease Control to impose an absolutely lawless rent moratorium throughout the country, depriving landlords of the ability to evict, evict tenants who didn't pay the rent they had contracted to pay. To leftists, property rights and contractual obligations are not important. They'd rather pose as champions of the poor, giving no thought to the long run damage they do to the rental housing market. Furthermore, during the COVID hysteria, state and local officials have issued orders that close many businesses. 
there was never reason to believe that their lockdown orders would do anything to prevent the spread of the disease, nor was there any legal authority for those decrees. The politicians just assumed that they had to do something to look good, and they issued sweeping decrees that ruined many businesses and destroyed jobs. The liberty to run a business was sacrificed without any concern by imperious politicians who said that lockdowns were the best and only means of safety. And now we face the disturbing prospect of government vaccine passports that would restrict the liberty of those Americans who've had COVID and prefer to, prefer to rely upon their nationally acquired immunity. And also those who just don't think that the risk of getting COVID is worth the cost and risk of vaccination. The idea of such passports appeals to statists who love the notion of subjecting people to their control, but they won't stop COVID from continuing to mutate and spread. Actually, the failure of the passports to accomplish that will then be cited as a reason to adopt still more draconian policies like the appalling restrictions that we're seeing in Australia. The powerless condition of liberty in America is further evidence by the way, so many of us eagerly embrace the spirit of control. I suspect that most of you listening this evening have been accosted by the so-called Karens for not complying fully with government edicts about wearing a mask or two, despite the lack of evidence that they do any good. I have been. Their mindset is that, if the, that since the state knows what is for the common good, everyone must obey. That is a mindset hostile to liberty it's exactly the mindset the authoritarians have been cultivating, however. Now let's pause for a moment and take stock. The political class in America consists largely, though not entirely, of people who are tyrants at heart. They like to boss the rest of us around and will seize upon any excuse for doing so. And they are getting bolder. Furthermore, a large proportion of the population isn't much concerned about liberty. To them, it's an old fashioned concept, not in keeping with modern times. They believe that control by the state is necessary, that it's scientific, and they will vehemently oppose efforts at rolling back government power. After all, when was the last time government power was ratcheted down? Uh, maybe back in the 1980s, but certainly not lately. It's been ratcheting up steadily. Furthermore, to those points, let's add the fact that statists have vast resources of money backed up their, by their ability to use the power of government to reward their friends and damage their enemies. And that's why I'm very skeptical about the prospects for liberty. Let me quote from an Australian writer, Harrison Pitt. While the situation varies across the Anglosphere in all its countries from Australia to Britain, the relationship between the individual and the state has fundamentally transformed. And these conditions will likely outlive the pandemic. Sydney remains under a draconian lockdown as does New Zealand after the discovery of just one case of coronavirus. The British and Canadian governments intend to make freedom uh, conditional on state issued vaccine passports. While well, President Biden, fresh from his Afghanistan debacle, recently called on parents to mask up their children when they leave the house. These measures can easily be relaxed or intensified by government officials at a moment's notice. But while restrictions can be tweaked, few in power have renounced the overarching authority they represent. In this sense, they are symbols of an abiding new normal, which before 2020 was utterly unthinkable in free societies. Now, before leaving the topic of COVID, let me that government officials have announced that they intend to treat future emergencies in the same fashion with imperious declarations that will further decrease our liberty. For instance, gun violence and white supremacy have been touted as new emergencies that call for dictatorial policies by state and federal government. The extraordinary treatment of the individuals arrested for the January 6th protest in Washington shows that the rule of law is being cast aside when it suits the needs of authoritarian politicians. Now, another attack on liberty of uh, property and business owners comes in the form of non-discrimination laws that now make it illegal to decline to do business with certain classes of people. One well-known case involves the owner of a cake shop, a devout Christian who doesn't care to produce cakes to celebrate events that he doesn't approve of, such as gay weddings. 
Under the America of old, if someone proposed to do business, it was perfectly legal for the offeree to decline. Offer, off, owners had the freedom to say no. And if so, the other party simply took his business elsewhere. That freedom, however, has been taken away by non-discrimination laws that establish protected classes of people to whom you cannot say no. The Masterpiece Cake Shop case was litigated to the US Supreme Court, which ruled in favor of the owner on the grounds that the state of Colorado was infringing upon the owner's religious liberty. Now, a stronger basis for the decision would have been pure freedom of contract. But despite the court's ruling, regulators in Colorado continue to attack the owner simply for saying no to people who could get their cakes elsewhere. The law has been turned into a sword that ideologues can use as a weapon against property owners they happen to dislike. Liberty declines further. Now, another attack on property rights is known as civil asset forfeiture. Under these laws, federal and state, Officials can seize property from anyone on the mere suspicion that it was somehow derived from or used in the commission of a crime. No judicial proceeding is required. The police or other government agents simply announce to the owner that they are taking his cash, car, or even real estate because it might be guilty. Then it's up to the owner to work through a maze of legal proceedings if he wants to get it back. And in such proceedings, the presumption of innocence does not apply. The owner must prove that, for example, the cash was not gotten through the drug trade. And if the owner is not able to convince the court that the property, the property was uh, wrongfully taken, then the government gets to keep it, sell it, with the proceeds going to the police budget. The law of corruption is obvious. Civil asset forfeiture has been around for a long time, and there have been some efforts to reform or even repeal the laws in a few states, most notably New Mexico, uh, those efforts have been successful. In many others, however, the police have shot down reform efforts saying that they need civil asset forfeiture to fight the drug war, never mind the innocent victims. Moreover, it seems that the officials are getting even bolder in using civil asset forfeiture. In a case I read about recently, government officials were investigating a company that rented safe deposit boxes for some alleged violation of law. FBI agents obtained a warrant to investigate the boxes rented by customers, saying that they would only search them for evidence of wrongdoing by the company, a rather absurd supposition, and that they would take nothing from the boxes. Nevertheless, the agents seized some $85 million worth of property from the boxes, and now the owners must go to court to try to get their property back. <clears throat> And one more thing, there is little chance of ever holding these corrupt officials responsible when they abuse their authority. As with civil assets forfeiture or anything else that is due to a, that is due to a government, to, to a judicially created doctrine known as qualified immunity, which protects them against suit as individuals. Thus they can attack our liberty and property with impunity. Now I've only scratched the sur surface when it comes to the assault against American liberty. New threats appear almost daily as the political class finds new problems and emergencies that they say can only be solved by expanding the scope and power of the government. A compliant media helps them spread the word to a gullible populace, much of it badly miseducated and dependent upon government for handouts. And bear in mind that the takers now outnumber the makers in America. So what chances liberty have? Our patient is in grave condition. Let's examine it more closely. The root of the problem is that fewer and fewer people still believe in liberty. When new restraints are imposed, few voices are raised in protest. The majority, I fear, consists of people who care only if their own freedom is cut back. They don't mind if other people are silenced, if other people have their property seized, or if other people are forced into medical procedures. So the next question is, why are they not concerned about the erosion of liberty? First and foremost, blame for that must fall on our abysmal education system. Long ago, the state has set their sights on controlling education so they could implant their ideas into young minds. And in that, they have been supremely successful. Our teachers and professors are overwhelmingly progressive in their outlook. 
They are absolutely certain that government can and must solve our problems. Students hear nothing but praise for government activism, such as the New Deal or Obamacare. Conversely, they rarely, if ever, hear anything favorable about the accomplishments of laissez-faire capitalism or voluntary charity. Nor will they learn about the harmful side effects of government programs meant to solve unemployment, housing shortages, and so on. Furthermore, students are taught to be intolerant of contrary opinions. Many absorb their teachers' hatred for the opponents of statism and are taught to dismiss libertarian arguments as racist or greedy. They never learn how to logically respond to intellectual adversaries, despite the claims that schools make about teaching critical thinking. The statists don't want people who think, they want people who conform and obey. Therefore, an essential step if we are to preserve liberty and start recovering it is to get students out of the hostile environment posed by our current education system. On this front, there's at least a little bit of good news. COVID has caused large numbers of parents to get their kids out of public schools and into private schools or homeschooling. Unfortunately, private schools aren't always free of pro-state propaganda. The parents might at least get somewhere if they object to it and say they only want to pay for beneficial education. It's encouraging to see parents objecting to the invasion of critical race theory into the curriculum. But even if they are successful in eliminating it officially, most teachers will still continue to spread CRT and other perverse ideologies on the sly. What we desperately need is for people of means to invest in alternative schools, schools that will provide good basic education without political indoctrination. Such schools would draw students away from the miserable status schools we now have. On higher education, there's also a little bit of good news. Enrollments are declining as people finally figure out that college have been, has been tremendously oversold. Men, especially, have been choosing against college. They're far better off learning to be electricians or auto mechanics than getting college degrees that betoken little or no useful knowledge. In doing that, they avoid both a load of student debt and absorbing lots of status blather about America's supposed ills. <clears throat> but what we need for the huge numbers of students who still think that getting a college degree is essential are new colleges and universities that will provide worthwhile education without the overlay of progressive ideology. I think we need at least one top flight national university that will eschew all of the idiotic fads that have washed over our education institutions in higher education, especially the toxic trio of diversity, inclusion, and equity. We also need many other regional and local colleges like that. It might even be possible for boards of trustees to reclaim some existing schools by rooting out the departments, courses, and professors that undermine liberty. Unfortunately, I know of no cases where that has happened, but it is possible. A non-politicized education would be good, but even better would be one that included an understanding of the benefits of liberty and the disadvantages of statism. At some of these new or revived colleges, we should expect a few courses at least that would emphasize the blessings of liberty and the disasters that statism has brought to humanity. Better education will help to save liberty, but it won't be enough. We need to enlighten the public through means other than formal education. Better journalism would help immensely. As things stand, journalism is dominated by people who are imbued with a status mindset who pitch everything they write so as to extol big government and ridicule anyone who argues that freedom works better than coercion. The old media won't change any more than the old colleges will, so we have to work to develop new channels for communicating news and opinion. The status will no doubt use every trick they can to block the growth of such channels, so we'll have to be nimble and perhaps even clandestine in our efforts. Whenever we write or talk, we should try to emphasize that liberty leads to innovation, cooperation, and prosperity, while statism leads to stagnation, divisiveness, and falling standards of living. We must also persuade people of the truth of the key point of F.A. Hayek's, namely, that in a system of big government, the worst inevitably get on top. 
Power net inevitably attracts unscrupulous, evil people whose plans end up ruining the lives of millions. Now, another way of communicating the need for liberty is through popular books and film. And we are doing some of that now. For example, a few years ago, a film was made about the despicable eminent domain case in Kilo versus New London. That film sympathetically depicted Suzette Kilo, whose little pink house was taken from her and destroyed just because scheming Oakland politicians wanted a big commercial development that would bring in more tax money for them to squander. The movie was good and no doubt made viewers aware of the way that the government power is abused. There are untold other stories of evil government that wait to be told. Cases of civil asset forfeiture, of lethal drug raids, of deplorable schools, and so on. And let's not forget that many Americans will read novels. We can put our ideas in front of them with fiction. And I have to say that I've taken a stab at that myself with a novel I wrote last year and which will be published next year by Post Hill Press. It's tentatively entitled, The Enlightenment of Jennifer Van Arsdale. She's a woke writer who's chosen to write the biography of America's first woman president, a statist whom Jennifer admires. But unexpected things happened and Jen winds up listening to people who hold opinions about topics ranging from gun control to education that she begins to find convincing. And how she handles the severe cognitive dissonance leads to a national uproar, but I won't give away more than that. Summing up, liberty in America is in grave condition. Its enemies are relentless, intent on forcing all of us into a controlled society. The life they have in store for us is much like feudalism, where a few elites ruled over the toiling masses who were just supposed to do as they were told. It doesn't occur to most of today's progressives that the consequences of their vision would mean misery for themselves, but they aren't good at long run thinking. We're moving quickly away from a country where people were free to live their lives as they chose, so long as they acted peacefully, and into a country where people must obey the commands of the rulers. Laws used to protect the liberty of individuals, but the rule of law has been badly subverted such that politicians and bureaucrats and judges now can impose their personal desires. And that, of course, is exactly what brought about the American Revolution. People got fed up with high-handed authoritarian British officials telling them what they must or must not do. But what are current Americans made of? Yes, the let's go Brandon chants are good, but when will we hear let's restore liberty? I'll close with this. Ronald Reagan was right when he observed, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. It must be fought for, protected, and hand, handed on to our children to do the same. Or one day, <clears throat> we will spend our sunset years telling our children what it was like when men were free. So I think we're close to the point of no return, but we're not past it. Liberty is down but the fight is not over. Thanks so much for listening. All right, thank you, George, for that excellent presentation. Fantastic. Lots of things there for people to ponder and reflect on and digest. So let's move into the questions. Uh, first one is, <clears throat> One of the big issues in criminal justice right now is the principle of qualified immunity for government officials. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of talk about it. Do you think, can you comment a little bit about qualified immunity? And do you think there's any possibility that that will be modified or ended? Yeah, qualified immunity is a judicially created doctrine. Uh, it actually it not only does not have any legal support behind it, it runs contrary to much legal precedent from early in our country, when there was absolute immunity for officials who violate the rights of the citizens. But in a, I believe the case was in 1982, the Supreme Court decided, well, gee, we think it would, it would be better if officials didn't have to worry about being sued when they violate people's rights. So the Supreme Court made up this doctrine of qualified immunity. 
Now, what the Supreme Court makes up, the Supreme Court can unmake up, and there have been challenges. I know the Cato Institute is very big on fighting qualified immunity these days. Uh, and I think that they're looking for some good cases they can uh, get to the Supreme Court, challenging that doctrine. And just, it's just possible that the court might backtrack and say, yeah, we, ma we made a mistake there. Uh, qualified immunity has led to great damage by imperious officials saying that they can uh, invade with impunity, uh, break into homes with impunity, uh, silence people with impunity. I, I think there's a chance we might might be able to get get past qualified immunity. Okay, uh, you mentioned universities and other private groups, and uh, the questioner here wants to know about the argument that private companies have the right to do whatever they want, including enforcing leftist status policies or beliefs, vaccine mandates, etc. Would you explain how you draw the distinction between a private group enforcing rights and as compared to the role of government in, in infringing rights? Well, I agree. Private companies can do what they want to do. If they want to fire people for saying things that conflict with left-wing orthodoxy, as long as it's not in violation of the contract, they, they're free to do that. And um, if a private university wants to fire somebody for having spoken out in a way that they wish he would not have spoken out, entitled to do that. My point was not to say that what those, those actions should be illegal, but rather how they reflect the decline in the belief in liberty, uh, the decline of the, the live and let live philosophy, the idea that if you don't agree with something, we should punish you. It's, it's not that you should be illegal, but I'm saying it's, it reflects the decline of the, the American philosophy of liberal, liberalism that we used to uh, hold, hold so sacred. Okay. Uh, this question says, your bio says you taught logic. What's the best way to logically fight this woke culture? <laughs> <laughs> uh, to logically fight the woke culture, you have to point out its terrible, terrible consequences. Uh, the woke culture is destroying freedom. And as we destroy freedom, we destroy the, the basis for our prosperity. We destroy the, the supports for uh, our freedom to live our lives as we choose. Pointing out the consequences you know, that's what the, the wokesters are, are really bad at doing, is thinking through the long run consequences of their conduct. If they really understood, you know, think about, you know, some of the wokesters who, who like the idea of, of communism in 1917 in Russia. Well, a lot of them wound up in the gulag or in front of firing squads or starving. Um, you know, people down in the Ukraine might have favored the communism, but they went up starving to death in 1932 under Stalin. So if you could get these people to understand the long run consequences. Now, a, a big part of that, I think, is the point I made about uh, Hayek's comment about the worst getting on top. Explain to these people that the bigger the government is, the A lot of them say, oh, Donald Trump, the worst guy you could ever imagine. Well. Could you really want, if you really think so, what would happen if you really had a Donald Trump with the power of, of omnipotent government? Do you want that? Do you want to take that chance? I think that is one way to get them to rethink their position. Okay. Uh, let me ask my own question here, George. Uh, you talked about civil asset forfeiture, and mm. it just, it amazes me that that principle and that policy has been was first they were able to enact it. Yes. And second, that they've kept it, been able to keep it in existence. Do you see any progress in this area at all? Well, there, there has been some progress in some states. Uh, I mentioned New Mexico, which went really far. And New Mexico is a funny case. There was a, uh, a covert video that was shot where some police officers had a, 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 a training session by some guy who's telling them, now here's how you do it. You know, you find the most expensive cars and you, you tail them until they've done something wrong and you have fish and you can take them, you know, get seize these Mercedes. 
sell them and it'll really beef up your 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 police. That video went viral in the state and the people were so incensed that there was almost unanimous support. Uh, civil asset forfeiture very carefully. And I think New Mexico is now the one and only state that gets a rating of A from Institute for Justice. So sometimes fighting at the state level can work. Now the problem, however, is a much bigger player, and unless they shoot themselves in the foot like they did in New Mexico, is, is the, the police. They love civil asset forfeiture. They don't care if they take property away from people who are perfectly innocent if it pads their budget. They're perfectly content with doing that. And they will fight, and they have a lot of legislators on their side, and they'll say, well, we needed to fight the drug war. And a lot of people will fall for that line. So, well, we've made some progress in the states. Um, we haven't made too much. Now, at the federal level, there's been federal legislation introduced. I think Rand Paul has introduced it, several, several Congresses running, to pull the, the fangs out of the federal uh, civil asset forfeiture law. But that never got any place. It never, of course, it gets no place under the Democrats, and it never got any place under Trump either. Uh, but maybe in the future. And I think, again, if, if the cases of civil asset for, forfeiture are well publicized, now here's where the media falls down again. Uh, these are terrible cases that deserve to be highly publicized and would really make a splash with, with the American public if they knew. So if we, if we could get some media writers who, who understand the evil of these laws and the damage they do to innocent people, I think we could build a movement. And now also, I like that idea of, of uh, using a movie, like um, the movie Little Pink House showed the evil of, of uh, eminent domain. We could have movies showing the evils of civil asset forfeiture. Okay, uh, this is a electoral question. I don't know whether you wanna address it or not, but did the state's monopolization of the ballot and the censorship of voter choices after the 1890s, render officials immune to electoral discipline by citizens? I'm afraid I don't know how to answer that one. Yeah, I'm not sure what he's um, not, not familiar, to there, not familiar with, the, the, with, the, with the background of that question. Okay, uh, then let's wrap it up with two questions that are gonna really ask the same thing. And this is gonna be the toughest question you're gonna get all night here. So let All me right. read the first one and then the second one. These might really stump you, George, uh, but okay. they both, rela they both um, relate to each other. So this is a pretty grim picture, realistic though it may be, that you've painted for those who value liberty. Have you got any parting crumbs of hope for a happy outcome? And then here's the second question. On balance, <laughs> are you pessimistic or optimistic? Have we reached the point of no return on real freedom in the United States? Okay. Uh, two related I'm, questions. Yes. Well, I, I entitled my talk, Are We Past the Point of No Return? My conclusion is we're close to it. The statists have tremendous power. They have brainwashed a huge swath of the population. They have enormous wealth to spend and, and no compunction whatsoever about using and abusing the power of the state to get their way. Nevertheless, uh, liberty is down on the canvas, but not out. Uh, one you know, one help, hopeful little sign are the, the uh, let's go Brandon chants that are starting a chants and bumper stickers. I think there are quite a few Americans who are just starting to wake up to the fact that we are losing the very basis for our peace and prosperity in this country. And they're starting to fight back. So it's not a hopeless battle. Um, also, when I see parents pulling their kids out when they see bad things happening in schools, uh, those, those parents are, their, their views are getting around. So. Uh, there, there's, there's some reason for optimism. 
Plus, we also have Future Freedom Foundation publicizing the importance of liberty every single day. So, yeah, we're not giving up. We're fighting. Well, thank you for fight. that. And, and <laughs> let me let me add to that that you know, back in let's say 1895 or so, when you had a society with without all this statism or most of the statism, no income tax, no Federal Reserve, no paper money, no Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Welfare yeah. state, Pentagon, CIA, immigration controls, and so forth. Uh, the progressives must, I mean, they had every reason to be pessimistic about their chances of moving America in a, in a socialist interventionist direction. And yet they kept pressing ahead yes. and they ultimately prevailed. Well, the way I figure it is yeah. the same thing can happen in reverse. Well, that's, that's why I think we need new educational institutions. The progressives took over the government education system, public schooling. They made it, they made it status schooling. We need to kind of uh, turn the tables on them, get, get kids out of those awful schools. And more parents are realizing, you know, not only are they getting brainwashed, but they don't learn to read and write. They don't learn math. They don't learn the things that will make them productive citizens. If we come up with better schools, and I, there are people who are putting their money into alternative schools, I think parents will flock to them. Okay. Well, on that note, thank you very much again, George. And uh, I have unfortunate news that we've received word from Radley that he could not get his internet connection working. So we'll reschedule it. You'll get another twofer. We'll, we'll add him on mm -hmm. to one of the remaining mm -hmm. speakers in the schedule. Um, but that then wraps everything up. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you, George, again, for sharing your insights with us and for your time. My pleasure. And next week, Jonathan Turley. You don't want to miss Turley. Those of you who remember that uh, Jonathan spoke at our, um, our Civil Liberties Foreign Policy Conference back in 2007, 2008, that we had in Reston, Virginia. Fantastic presentation. Uh, I mean, Tur Jonathan Turley is one of the greatest proponents of civil liberties uh, in the country. He's professor of law at George Washington University. So you won't want to miss him. You, he's, you're in store for a real treat with Turley. So thank you again for tuning in. Thank you, George. And we will see you all next week. My pleasure. <laughs>